If you have your Bibles this morning, I want to go to Leviticus chapter 23. I've got some extra notes up here. God's been speaking to me during praise and worship. Biblically, according to God's calendar, astrologically, agriculturally, with his calendar, the way that he set things up that uh, we're beginning to return to, that the Day of Atonement starts at sunset tonight. And it is the most holy, it is the most solemn of all the feasts of God. And so it, it, I know in times past I have just taught on the significance of the Day of Atonement, but today I want to get into prophetically where we are. Uh, God has been speaking some things to me, and, and uh, I just want to get into that because I want us to be ready for the times. I want us to be ready uh, for what God's going to do. Starting with verse 26, And the Lord spake to Moses, saying, also the tenth day of this seventh month shall be the day of atonement. It shall be a holy convocation for you. You shall afflict your souls and offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. And you shall no, do no work on the same day, for it is the day of atonement to make atonement before, uh, for you before the Lord your God. For any person who is not afflicted in soul at the same day shall be cut off from his people. And any person who does any work on the same day, that person I will destroy from among his people. You shall do no manner of work. It shall be a statute forever. How long did that say? Forever. Throughout your generations and all your dwellings. And it shall be to you a, so a Sabbath of solemn rest, and you shall afflict your souls on the ninth day of the month at evening. From evening to evening you shall celebrate your Sabbath. And so this is, this is a time to, uh, to do a lot of things. And one of the things, in, in the days of awe, this year I have noticed is different uh, than past years. In that, you know, you, you purposely try to examine your life and to kind of examine where you, it's a time of, of introspection. That you, you want to make sure I'm right with man, that I've not done anything that I have not made right. I've, that there's, there's nothing that, uh, uh, that is between me and God that the blood of Jesus has not covered. And what I have discovered this year is not only were we examining ourselves, but the Holy Spirit was examining us as well. And many of the things that we thought were taken care of, which really weren't taken care of, they were simply buried, the Holy Spirit brought up to the surface this week. And how? And all God's people said, oh, me. <laughs> I mean, uh, whether it was anger or, or whether it was a sin that you thought you had conquered that maybe you didn't really have conquered, the Holy Spirit brought it up during the days of awe for us to get right, to get settled, to get it done the right way. And uh, I'm glad for that because uh, we need to take those things to the cross. We need to take them to the cross to get them right. And what I have found is the Holy Spirit has been bringing to the surface things of the spirit, things of the soul, and things of the body, so that all of it can stand before the king. Because I think in the days ahead, this concept of a righteous judge, that there is a time opening up that we're going to be able to ask the judge to rule in our behalf. And to be able to do that, you got to stand before the judge, and you don't want yourself coded in the stuff of the very enemy that you're asking him to make a judgment in your behalf for. You don't want to be the plaintiff who's wearing the robes of the enemy. You don't stand before a Jewish king and wear Babylonian garments and ask him to judge Babylon. You don't have Achan's gold and silver in your pockets as you're doing it. But I, I, I'm beginning to sense that this uh, this introspection took another turn. God began to deal with me that there are God-given dreams that have been wounded by the enemy. That some of the things that we have gone through in the last decade or more has tried to take the very dreams that God has given us and has trampled them into the dirt that we, we have kicked from dream mode to survival mode. 
just getting by. Well, I, I guess it's all right because I'm still here. God wants you to be more than just still here. God has given us dreams that he wants us to do in the kingdom, and that is far beyond just surviving the trampling of the enemy. It's time for us to rise up because the enemy thought we were like Jesus, that we had been beaten down, that we had been put in, 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 in graves, if you will. But the Holy Spirit is getting ready to release some resurrection power within his people. Satan has made sure that vision has grown dim. We're going to deal with some interesting things out of the book of Isaiah this morning that I've never really equated in the way that I'm going to take it, that the Holy Spirit has been leading me. But we need to understand God is getting ready to restore vision. Some of us, our vision has been reduced to like blind Bartimaeus, that we, oh, we, we, we can hear but we can't see. Or we may be like the man the first time that Jesus prayed for him. He says, can you see? And our vision has been so blurred that it, all I see men as trees. But the king is getting ready to restore vision. Because the word says, where there is no vision, my people perish. You see, just surviving is just on the edge of perishing. Haven't you realized that yet? Just surviving, just getting by, just saying, I'm still here. That's on the edge of perishing. God is wanting us to move beyond that. He wants to switch this thing on the devil to where you're, like, you're not like the prize fighter getting his head beat in at the beginning, at the end of the fight. He's going to restore you to where you're fresh like the fighter at the beginning of the fight, and he's going to do it at the end of the fight. We call it for runners, we call it the second wind. I don't know about you, but when I was in the army, I could never find my second wind. It was always the pain. <laughs> if you've ever run, you know what I'm talking about. You know, the pain kind of starts in your side and it begins to move upward and downward. They said if you could ever make it through the pain, you could you you you'll find that window to get your second wind. I never found my second wind. I'll, I never found the door, never found the window. I think it was a mouse hole that I could never get through. But in the spirit. We're beginning to get there. God also told me that hearts have grown weary. Oh, you guys don't know the half of it. Not only here, and I'm not just talking about me. I hear it all the time from those in ministry that they are beaten, they are weary, they have lost their vision, that they have went for, they went into maintain mode because it looked like those that compromised the word would thrive while those that stayed to the word were being judged as old-fashioned, were being judged as you're not moving with the times, you're, you're antiquated. Well, I tell you what, if righteousness is antiquated, call me old-fashioned. But you see, I want an old-fashioned revival. I want one of those Holy Ghost, devil-stomping, sin-killing. Causes the lame to walk and the blind to see. And for people to cast off the filthy sins, the garments of sin, and to put on the robes of righteousness. And righteousness is not just a state of being, it's a state of action that the righteous do righteous things. Now, this may be deep, but bad does bad things, righteous does righteous things, and you cannot say you're righteous and do bad things no more than you can be bad and do righteous things. But if you have been made righteous on the inside, you will have acts of righteousness on the outside as defined by the Word of God. We're getting back to that. God told me that the Holy Spirit beginning tonight at sunset, and it'll, it'll go for a while, that he will begin blowing on the embers of what used to be raging fires of passion and holiness within God's people, that the Satan has successfully reduced it to nothing but a few embers. But the Holy Spirit is going to blow on the embers. He's going to rekindle the fire of the kingdom of God within. 
We're going to have holiness on the inside so we can have holiness on the outside. We're going to have the vision within so that it could be produced without. God is not only going to give the dream, but he's going to give the power to create the dream. We're going to be as Zerubbabel that when he saw the temple finished, he stood in the midst of it and said, Grace! Because it's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. Guys, I believe that there is a new refreshing coming from heaven. This refreshing not only has the power to crush sin, but to restore vision and to reignite the holy fires of passion for those whom the enemy has worn out through past battles and past struggles. If you look at the Hebrew calendar, the Jewish calendar, that we're getting ready to go into year 5772, and it's represented by two Hebrew letters. You always look at the last two letters, or last two numbers, and it's ayin and aleph. Ayin means I, aleph means strength, that heaven's attention is back to restoring the strength of his people of those who were faithful, that even though they didn't have any strength, they said, if I got to crawl for Jesus, I'll crawl. God is getting ready to give them the second wind. You say, why is this significant? In Daniel 7, 25, it says, and he shall speak great words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High to think to change the times and laws and they shall be given into his hand for a time and times of the dividing of times. Now that's talking about the Antichrist, but there's the same pattern. There, are, there is a time each generation that Satan is given the power from God or given the right from God to wear out the saints because it separates the men from the boys. It separates the remnant from the chaff. And we have gone through a, a season of him being given the power to wear out the saints because it separates those who are just in it for the game, that are just in it for the, the, the commotion, that are just in it for the entertainment, and those that will really walk with God. You see, the remnant will hold on to God if they never see anything in their lifetime. They know that this word is true and that whether they see it in their life or not, if they die holding on to this Bible, when they open their eyes again in a few moments, they will stand before the king and he will make it right. That's the attitude of the remnant. And see, with every generation, there's a shifting that goes. There is a separating of the chaff from the wheat. There's a time of wearing out the saints. And let me tell you something. God is getting ready. Those that remain true to God's word in the kingdom and the wearing out are about to experience resurrection power. Hear me. Because I'm not just talking to us here. I'm talking to ministers all over the country and around the world. That their hands, that they feel like Moses, they can't even keep their hands up anymore and they're looking for a Joshua and a Caleb to try to lift up their hands. They're so weary. The Holy Ghost is beginning to raise up their hands. The dreams, the visions, and the purposes given by God that were reduced to almost coma-like states by the enemy has been renewed, revived, and empowered by heaven. One of the things that God told me this morning is that beginning with tabernacles and running throughout 2012, those that have waited upon the Lord shall renew their strength. You know, it's interesting that, the, that all the occult in all the world is believing that in 2012 calamity is going to happen. Yes. Because all the work that they have done to push down the church is going to be overturned. <laughs> Their world is about ready to come to an end because darkness is going to be broken. They're trying to recreate the 60s. They literally are. 
But an interesting thing about the 60s was that uh, and it was re with rebellion, with drugs, with sex, with the occult, all wrapped in together. But there were some that, go, that went so far into it, they went out the other side and found Jesus. Come on now. There may have been the Bill Ayers that just went and stepped back and said, I'll release my darkness later. But there was the Jesus movement. There were those that found revival, the charismatic movement. And when it was really walking with God the way that it was supposed to, was all birthed out of that. History is about to repeat itself. Because you get so far into darkness, you start seeking light, real light. Mm. If you have your Bibles, I want to go to Isaiah 40, starting in verse 27. What's interesting is, you know, we always quote it, we sing it. Those that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. And as you know, I, I've always read that, and I'm saying, why do they want to walk if they can run? If you can run and not grow weary, you just, I remember when I was a kid, you know, little kids, they just run everywhere. They don't have slow. Come on now. You're like, Slow down. This walk. Uh -uh. They're not weary. They run till they fall over. Then they take a nap and they're right back at it again. So, you know, and, they're, and they're, they're, kids have the attitude, why do I want to walk if I can run? I'm big. I get there faster, you know. So, you know, why, why is it in the Word of God? Why do you have to worry about walking if you can run? Let's read it and I'm going to tell you why. Let's start at verse 27. Why sayest thou, O Jacob, and, speak, and speakest, O Israel? My way is hid from the Lord, and my judgment is passed over from my God. Hast thou not known, hast thou not heard, that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary? There is no searching of his understanding. He giveth power to the faint. If you're faint this morning, reach up for power. And to them that have no might, he increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and young men shall utterly fall. But, oh, I tell you what I love when I see but in the Word of God. Those that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. And we, we think that we're, well, I'm waiting on the Lord. What does that mean? Hold up. I'm just waiting on the Lord. That's not what that's talking about. It means constant, honest service to him. You see, the, the remnant, the, the remnant, remnant. I'm trying to go two different directions at the same time this morning. The remnant when they were faithful to God's word and held to the kingdom when nobody else were, God says, you're waiting on me. While everybody else is serving the flesh, you're serving the Lord. That word wait, it has another root word, it, mikra, but it has, it, it's found in another word, mikvah. It means to be intertwined. You see, when you get intertwined with God, it showed up in baptism in mikvah because you have mikra. You have, you have int intertwined yourself just like on the zitzi that you have the blue cord that's so intertwined that represents Messiah that as I was obedient in the tough times, I have intertwined myself in God in my waiting that it wasn't out of popularity. It was not out of what is normal within society, whatever vain way that they are going, that I did it because it was right when nobody else was doing it. And because of that, I have intertwined myself with God so that when I am weary, he all of a sudden where I've intertwined myself, his strength can come into me. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. Do you know how an eagle weathers the storm? It flies into it. And the power of the storm lifts it up above the storm. Let me tell you something. God's getting ready to allow the power of the storm that's coming is going to lift you up above the storm, and you're going to look down upon it. It's not going to be above you controlling it. You're going to be up above the storm. 
because there's a storm coming. God gave me the secret of why they shall run and they shall walk. They shall run and they shall walk. Habakkuk says, to write the vision, make it plain that them that read it may run with it. You see, you run with a vision, but you walk in God's ways. It's going to click here in a minute. A vision you run with. And there are those that have lost their vision, and therefore they have grown weary. But God's getting ready to interject back the vision so that they can run. And those who have been walking in the ways of God when nobody else has been, God's getting ready to add power to the walk. I'm not going for a stroll. I'm a power walker. <laughs> Oh, you see, when you power walk, wherever the soles of your feet shall tread yeah. shall be yours. You can't do that on a stroll. God also began dealing with me this week about understanding the strategic na nature of the Messiah's comings. The first time that Jesus came, he was Messiah ben Joseph. He was the suffering servant. God perfectly set the stage for Jesus to come the first time to release grace. Remember me dealing with that, that when, when, when Yahweh Elohim created the heavens and the earth, it is grace and justice that were balanced. And so the first time that Jesus came, he was Yahweh in the flesh. He was grace in the flesh. Did you know that if it had not been for the Maccabees, the reason for Hanukkah, if it had not been for the Maccabees, there would have never been a rededication of the temple. If there was not a rededication of the temple, Jesus could have never went in the temple, nor would there have been a priesthood, nor would there have been a high priest that declared that he be the sacrifice so that Israel might be saved. I mean, God was strategic. That was essential for the atonement for the sins of man. Thanks to Alexander the Great and the, the, the Greconizing of, of, of the whole known world at that time, everybody spoke Greek. All the Gentiles spoke Greek. All of them spoke Greek. God has strategically placed it in the heart of the rabbis to translate the Tanakh into Greek. It's called the Septuagint. And it wasn't done after Jesus came. It was, done, it was already there. They had already been using it for a long time. Because he knew that when Jesus did what he did, that the gospel was going to be released to the Greeks. To the Greek-speaking world. And all these Gentiles coming in, they already had the Bible in their language. The apostle Paul didn't say, oh, you got to learn how to speak Hebrew before you can read the word. He handed them the Greek Tanakh and said, learn about Messiah. It was, and if all the known world was already speaking Greek, it was a universal language. Come on now. And Rome at that time did not have everybody speaking Latin because Latin was the tongue of the Roman and the Roman Empire, yet they all had to speak Greek because Alexander the Great had done such an efficient job of making sure that that was the language that went with education. And God says, thank you. I think I'll use it to expand my kingdom as I reach into the Greeks. God included both the Jewish people a must and the Roman Empire in the crucifixion of Messiah so that the Jew and the Gentile could benefit from his gift. Not only did the high priest say that he must be sacrificed, so did Pontius Pilate. And it was done as an official act of the Roman Empire so that the gospel could be released to the Gentile world. I don't know about you, but that is so strategic, it is almost mind-boggling. When he comes back, he's coming back not as Messiah ben Joseph again. He will not be the suffering servant. The Bible says he will only suffer once. Once. When he comes back, he's Messiah ben David, the conquering king, the lion of the tribe of Judah, who's not coming down to pussyfoot it around. He's coming down to conquer. Now, God perfectly knows 
when it's the perfect time for Jesus to come back and judge. Judgment is as essential to the survival of mankind as the first time he came was essential for the salvation of mankind. You see, Lucifer will first deceive man, then control man, and be worshipped by man, but his end game is the total destruction of man. Jesus tells us in, in uh, Matthew chapter 24, verses 21 and 22, and then shall be a great tribulation such as not seen since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor shall ever be. And except those days be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. And that's not talking about salvation. In the Greek, it means survive. But the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. In those seven years, not only does the Antichrist take over the world, his, his end game is the total destruction. He does not want one. He wants the human race to end because even no matter how bad a man is, no matter how caught in darkness he is, he is still in the image of God. And he is in the way of Lucifer. And so Jesus is going to come back just in the nick of time. And here's a question that ponders me. The elect is a, another word for the remnant, is another word for those that really walk with God. And if we're gone, why does the time have to be shortened? Hmm. Just, just put that in your theological pipe and smoke it for just a little bit and see how it kind of rattles through some of our theologies. You see, one of the things I am learning is within Islam, when you look at their creeds, they, they got to believe in Allah. Number two is they got to believe in the end times. Bef even before they believe in Muhammad, they got, it's, it's end times that that's drilled into them, we're going to take over the world, that we are going to have a caliphate worldwide, we are going to have a one world government, and that we control everything, and we will kill and destroy anyone that does not come in line with Allah. That's their passion, that's their purpose. Do you know how we prepare for the end times? We're getting out of here before anything happens. <laughs> we're not preparing anything. You see, if you're a warrior preparing for a fight, you train, you, you, you get rid of all the junk. We're like Rocky preparing for the big fight. Instead, we're 500 pounds sitting on a couch waiting to get raptured out of here, not even realizing that if God would do it, he'd have to go get a forklift to get you out of here. Come on now. Can you see the difference in the mindsets? Why aren't we preparing for the last day spiritually, emotionally, physically? Well, Mike... What happens if it is a pre-trib rapture? Then you go to heaven fit. You go to heaven clean. You go to heaven prepared. Your garments will be without spot nor wrinkle because you were a fighter getting ready for the prize fight. That's right. That's right. Not someone just waiting at the bus station. One well, of these days, that bus is going to show up. Yeah. I got my golden ticket. So what happens if I, if I have Bibles stored up and I have food stored up and I get out of here? I'm going to have a sign for those who get saved during the tribulation period. Come on to my house. Get the word of God. Some survival supplies. Feed your family with it. Because God used me as a Joseph to put the storehouse, just in case. But how many know that maybe, what happens if the rapture, because how many know that when you study theology, the pre-tribulation rapture is not only the youngest of all the eschatological positions, it's one of many. And many of them are espoused by the evangelical community. I'll accept all millennialism. I look at that and I say, oh, come on, you know. <laughs> We're not in the millennial period now because if we are, Jesus is not ruling and reigning from Jerusalem, and I'd like a refund. I don't like this movie. But what happens if it's 10 months into the tribulation period before he takes us out or something like that? 
I'd like to have 10 months of food and 10 months of bail to give Bibles and to help people and love people and to show them, don't, don't fall for that silly guy that's thinking he's God in the flesh. No, he's not. Don't fall for that darkness. That's just some thoughts just to think about and chew on for a while. But one of the things, too, and, and you guys have been noticing I have been bringing up Isaiah quite a bit. God keeps taking me back to Isaiah. Just taking back to Isaiah. You see, I, I think in the days ahead, what we thought was New Testament, what we, we have separated, we say, starting with Matthew is New Testament. And therefore, the Old Testament is separate. Isn't that the attitude? But when you read the book of Acts, I see a lot of Old Testament in there. I, I see not only the power of Elijah and the power of Messiah. I see some judgment of God. There was, there was Herod Agrippa that spoke like a God. And when all of them said, he spoke like a God and he didn't immediately give praise to God, worms devoured him. So, I mean, there were, there were some things going on here that really sounded Old Testament to me. We're getting ready to go back to some Old Testament. Well, Mike, how could that happen? Because th haven't you read the Gospels that over and over again to understand what Jesus was doing and what he did, they constantly went back to the book of Isaiah over and over again. And he did this that it might be fulfilled, which Isaiah had said. And then he goes further, and this is what Isaiah spoke. And even when they looked at the cross, they said, this is what it meant. Isaiah and the writings of Isaiah were paramount to Messiah ben Joseph, and they're going to be paramount to Messiah ben David. To find out what God's up to, you're going to have to go back to the book of Isaiah. We've been spending, and, and I mean, oh, the book of Daniel's great, the book of Revelation is great, but you better throw Isaiah into the mix to find out what's going on. I mean, God won't let, it's like, I, I start reading what was going on with the northern and the southern tribes that, that he was writing about. I'm thinking, this sounds like America. I'm not alone. There's a Messianic rabbi named Jonathan Kahn that um, I just got, to, we, we got to watch him on Sid Roth. In fact, after we eat today, I'm going to bring it up on on there and let you guys watch it. But he, he found some interesting things that when God begins to judge a nation, there are nine messengers or nine harbingers that God releases. And it follows the same pattern. One of the reasons that we have all of this is because it's an example for us that God always moves in the same pattern just like the devil always moves in the same pattern. You see, if God is absolutely just and absolutely right, that when he does something again, he'll go back and follow the same pattern because right is always right. It never has to change. And one of the things that, uh, in, in fact, he has a book called The Harbinger, and I thought it was really neat because I thought it was going to be just like a fact-finding book. It's available in Kindle right now. It's not in paperback till after the first of the year. But how many know, I mean, there was one book I, I read not too long ago uh, that was dealing with Islam. And just some people have a hard time going through it. When I, when I, when I, when I eat facts book that just gives me facts and compares things, to me it's like eating jelly beans, you know. But to some people it's like eating horseradish or something. I don't understand. But they, they have a hard time. Within this culture, you, you almost have to do it like a novel. You've got to get them caught in the adventure. And so what he did is he took all the facts and prophetically what God's doing, and he wrote it as a novel that you get caught up in this guy investigating to try to find out what God is doing, and God keeps sending him a prophet to show him. It's like, oh, no, this has happened. One of the things, when the northern tribes were attacked by the Assyrians, it was an act of terror. They didn't totally decimate them. They came in and attacked them, and it caused them to realize that there was a, there was a gap in the hedge of protection. Kind of like 9-11. It was a gap in the hedge of protection. God, God did not cause it to happen. He pulled back the hedge because we have torn it down ourselves. By our acts, by the very attitudes of this nation. We, what's amazing is we look at 9-11, we say, well, where was God? He was where you led him to be. You drove him out of schools. You drove him out of all public life. In our public squares, you have torn down his commandments. 
You have made it to a place that you can't even pray in Jesus' name anymore. You have driven all elements of him out of public life, and then when that public life gets attacked by the enemy, you have the audacity to say, where was God? You pushed him out of the way. And so God had to allow 9-11 to happen because it was a messenger to America. You see, when the Assyrians did their original attack, I'm going to read you Ephraim's response. It's found in Isaiah chapter 9, starting with verse 8. And it said, The Lord sent a word unto Jacob, and it hath lightened upon Israel. And all the people shall know, even Ephraim and the inhabitants of Samaria, that say in pride and stoutness of heart, that say in pride and stoutness of heart, that say in pride and stoutness of heart, the bricks have fallen down, but we will build up with hewn stone. The sycamores are cut down, but we will change them into cedar. You say, well, Mike, why is this so important? Because we had two government officials quote 9-10 after 9-11. Tom Daschle before the Congress and a presidential uh, vice president candidate John Edwards both got up after 9-11 and quoted this verse as their response to 9-11. The bricks are falling down, but we will build up hewn stones. The sycamores are cut down, but we will change them into cedars. And you don't know how accurate that is because the first building stone that they put back in to build up where the trade towers were been, they got a hewn cornerstone and set it into place. that there was a sycamore tree, there was one little green spot right near ground zero that had a sycamore tree. One of the beams from the Twin Towers took that tree out and pulled it up by the roots. And, that, and they turned that into a monument, a sign and a wonder. The tree is cut off, it's pulled up by the roots and it's still sitting there and they have made it into a monument so that the roots of the uprooted sycamore tree became a sign to this nation and it was replicated on Wall Street with a bronze version of it sticking up as, as, a, as artwork on Wall Street. In fact, the, I forgot the name of the, the tree. What, it's called Butterbuckle or something like that, which is another name. Huh? Buttonwood is another name for a sycamore. And see, before it was named Wall Street, the, the very place that established the commerce there that it became Wall Street was called the Buttonwood Club, and they met underneath a sycamore as they began to do business. You say, well, why is that important? Because our government planted a cedar tree where the sycamore used to be. It was a harbinger, a message from God, you're getting ready to get judged. And we are so removed from the things of God that we miss it. What about the terrorists? Well, it was the Assyrians that did this to the northern tribes. The Assyrians were the first army to perfect terrorism. They would cause terror wherever they went. They used terror as a tool. They reduced it down to a scientific modality of war. In fact, the closest thing that we have to the Assyrian language on the earth today is Arabic. In fact, in the terrorists, there was probably Assyrian blood flowing in their DNA. Well, how, how far is God going to take this example? We see Afghanistan really doesn't have the biblical significance of Iraq because in Iraq, and I, I, up by Mosul, I believe, there are two mounds. That's all that's left of Nineveh, which was the capital of the Assyrian nation. That we have boots on the ground and Iraq has now become the training place for them to figure out the best way to get our GIs. You see, they developed the IDE in 
Iraq, and now they're using it in Afghanistan. They're using it in other places. They're, the Assyrians are perfecting the art of terror in Iraq to come against America. And that's just, that's just two, but there are nine. You want to read them? Get the book. I mean, message after message, and what's in it goes from how our, what's going to happen with our finances to who's going to be president over the United States. All that stuff is found in the nine harbingers, and nine is the number of completeness. There are nine gifts of the Holy Spirit. There are nine fruits of the Holy Spirit, and when God gives judgment warnings of what's to come, he gives nine messages. You see, he has sent prophets for a long time, guys. For a long, long time, he has sent prophets. And just like Israel of old, they went from a distraction to where they, they go from being a distraction to where we try to marginalize them to where they become enemies of the state. And so God says, maybe I need to talk a little louder. So I'll add calamity, a harbinger, to the voice of the prophet. And prophets know that when God starts adding calamity to what they're saying, time short. Now, we, we, we've kind of got, things are getting bad, but things are getting good. Things are getting bad for the 90%, but the 10%, the remnant, things are getting ready to get good. I want to go to Acts chapter 3, verses 19 and 20. And I, I've never seen it this way before. This is speaking to the remnant right now. This is speaking to the people of God right now. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. I like that part, don't you? Repent, be converted. You see, we have a lot of repented that have never been converted. They're just sorry, but they're still living sorry lives that have never been converted over to living the ways of God. But look, it goes on, and when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord, and he shall send Jesus. Now, this is in the book of Acts. It's not he has sent Jesus. He shall send Jesus. So that means that as the remnant repents and is converted so that your sins are blotted out, that a time of refreshing will be released. And after the time of refreshing has come, then he's going to send Jesus. <laughs> remnant, repent. Repent so that you can be refreshed. As you repent, all the junk the devil has piled on you is going to fall off. That's why the feasts are so important. We're yearly reminded we got 10 days of just repenting and introspection that we're looking at getting rid of everything. And, so that, and now we're, we're in the process not only repenting but being converted, that our thinking is converted to God's way, that our doing is, th is converted to God's way, that our actions are converted to God's way. You see, the church is going to wake up to the fact. Now, we, we, we adopted this out of, out of Greco-Roman philosophy, that everything spirit is good and everything that is flesh is bad. That's, that's, that's what Socrates and, 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 and many of the Greek philosophers have taught. And the truth of the matter is, darkness can reside in the spirit. Have you never heard of the devil? Darkness can reside in the soul, evil thoughts and intents of the heart. And darkness can reside in the flesh, called sinful behavior. But we take the attitude, the charismatic church is taking the attitude, everything that's spiritual, the spirituals of God. No, they, they quit being Greco-Roman. The Jew knows that there's both sides in the spirit, that there is Hasatan, the adversary, in the spirit that wants to affect you, and that false prophets can work wonders, that high priest Janus and Jambres withstood Moses with supernatural power. So everything that is spiritual is not of God. There's two kingdoms working, and the remnant better find out who's who. That's right. That's right. And not only can darkness be seated in the soul, so can righteousness. That's the converting. 
I, I, I repent, I take care of the spiritual, I move from darkness to light, and then I'm converted, my soul moves from darkness to light, and then my flesh can be refreshed because the most powerful thing on the earth is flesh that is sanctified. Just like the most powerful thing in this earth realm on the, ki- on the darkness side is flesh taken over by sin. Every woe ever committed in this earth was flesh that had been controlled by darkness. And every righteous thing, every good thing that has ever happened is flesh sanctified to the light of God. So you see, spirit, soul, and body can be both sides. It can have light in it or it can have dark in it. Quit, quit trying to divide, to, to divide it from things of, the flesh or things of the physical world with things of the spiritual world and just make sure that every area of your life, spirit, soul, and body is walking in the light of God's ways. Come on now. Because there's a time of refreshing. You see, there's one thing that has always been kind of a quandary to me, and, and if you've been in, in charismatic circles, and I don't believe in reducing it to a formula, I don't believe in, uh, repeat after me, Rondai Shondai, because it always ends up, go drive a Hyundai. It, it don't work that way. You see, when, we, when, we, when the baptism of the Holy Spirit comes, it flows up out of your spirit. It's not a formula. Jesus comes and baptizes you in the Holy Ghost. And what I have seen is I have seen people it's like when, when I got it. I was a young Baptist minister. I've been preaching since I was 13. In my, in my 16th year, God and I had it up for a year. Theologically, I mean, because I had already been trained for three years to think as a Baptist, preach as a Baptist. And I started going into Christian bookstores, and everyone, they, they would hand me a book by Smith Wigglesworth. They'd hand me a book on, by Dennis Bennett on, on uh, the Holy Spirit. Everywhere I went, it was, it was like I had Holy Ghost stalkers. You know, you go into a bookstore to buy books, not have them given to you. And I started getting this stack of books on the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And, and so I thought, well, I'm going to be a good Baptist, and I'm going to go in, and I'm going to defunct those things. I'm going to prove biblically they're wrong, and the deeper I got, the more God and I argued. A year, God and I argued. And I said, okay, there's an Assembly of God church up here in Overland. I'm going to go there. You got one shot, God. I went to the altar once, got saved. I'm going to go to the altar once, and I'm going to get filled with the Holy Ghost. And if there isn't such a thing, never bring it up to me again. But I didn't realize when I walked in that church, God was holding up his sleeves. And, I, and I, I patiently waited for the song service. I listened to this. Oh, yeah, this is God. I wish he'd shut up and give the altar call. And I got up there and I said, I want. That's all I got. He reached up to lay his hands on me. And I mean, I, I had already put my feet. I, I see how these weirdos fall over. I go, I'm, boy, I tell you what, I'm going to be like an oak tree. <laughs> I mean, when you got a foot as big as mine, you can, you can take your toes and plant it down like big old roots into the ground. I ain't going nowhere, you know. And so, you know, most people say, oh, please pray for me. I'm saying, pray for me. <laughs> That's the attitude I had. I, I want to get this thing over with. I don't want to ever have to deal with it theologically again. I'm going to prove that this thing is wrong. And all he did was reach out to start. I, I remember his prayer. He could have popped me upside the head and said, bam, I don't know what he, what he did. But when I came to myself on the ground, I was praying in the Spirit. And we, we, we see people that receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit like that. And then as I was in the charismatic movement, there were those that sometimes would pray through for years before they got it. And we, we couldn't understand why. And I mean, they were honest. They, they were seeking. They, they tried to push hard. All I know is when God gets ready, you can't help but. And I'm getting ready to tell you that starting on the Feast of Tabernacles, the wind's going to blow, and it's going to blow all throughout 2012. Those that wait upon the Lord are going to come out the other end with some spiritual strength. That those that have been waiting at the end of 2012, you're not going to be waiting for nothing anymore. There are those that have been waiting for dreams to come from God. You're not going to be waiting anymore. There are some of us that have had dreams, but we, we never saw the fulfillment. 
at the end of 2012, we're not going to be waiting anymore. That God is going to begin loosing strength. You say, why are you saying this? Because beginning with tabernacles, we may just do some waiting and tearing during praise and worship. So this, this is a warning. Don't set nothing at home to have your food warm by the time that you get home. Because I'm not sure when we're going to get out of here. We may, we may praise and worship for a couple hours before I get to preach. And I guarantee you right now, if God moves and we go two to three hours, I will still preach that day and take my full hour. Well, Mike, how can you do that? Because I'm after the remnant. I'm not after a person saying, well, I can only take so much of God. I want all him I can get. You see, there was a time in America the reason that you had potluck suppers and stuff like that after church was because they would go all day. They'd go all day. And so you had to have someone with the five loaves and the two fishes to kind of feed some people because you don't want people passing out on the five. <laughs> Today we're fasting because we're having church all day. Things are going to change. That's right. Things are going to change. I mean, things are going to change from the boring blank wall with the, with the spatches that need to be covered over. We're going to redo this so that people that watch by video don't have to look at the same spots in the wall that they've watched for the last two or three years. We're going to change from that to everything we do. It's going to be by the breeze that's blowing by the Holy Spirit that day. But you've got to set in your heart right now, worry no more. The king is getting ready to judge I'm weary no more. I, I believe that Pastor Radhouse had it right this week when he wrote out a legal declaration that he's putting before God, a petition. He's a plaintiff asking the king to judge the devil. You need to write some of those out. Why has the devil stolen from you? Where, where has the devil, maybe he's stolen some of your health, maybe he's stolen some of your wealth, maybe he's stolen your vision, he has squashed your dreams, he has put out your fire, take it before the king. And I've shared this with you before in Revelation where it talks about they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony and they loved not their life unto death. And so we think that testimony is me sharing with Mary, me sharing with this guy. But if you look at the entire context of it, the verse before it, the devil is accusing them before the brethren and then they show up and by the blood of the lamb and giving their testimony before the judge, Appearing before a legal court, everything in the kingdom of God operates on legalism. It, 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 there are legalities. The universe operates on laws. Those laws keep the sun burning, keeps, keeps gravity where you don't just float off into space. Everything in the universe is governed by laws. Our very salvation is governed by laws. There are laws in the Torah that made salvation possible. That Jesus had to shed his blood because the Torah said, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. Everything was done according to God's legal court. And now the devil has told us the lie that Jesus destroyed the law. God forbid is what the Apostle Paul said. Why? Because if there's no law, the enemy can't get arrested. If there's no law, there's nothing to enforce. How can you enforce the kingdom of God when it has no laws? He is known as the lawless one, and yet most of the body of Christ preaches the gospel of lawlessness. We're going to wake up to the fact that he is the accuser of the brethren. That word in the Greek means like a prosecuting attorney bringing you before the judge. We need to turn the tables on him, and we need to start peering before the judge as in a legal court saying, Father, your word says this, and this is what the devil has done. Now I'm calling for restitution. I want the judge to rule in my favor because of the blood of Jesus and because I am bringing testimony before the court of God because the law is still in effect. The kingdom and its constitution is still in effect. 
The devil may have tried to take it out of our minds, but he did not take it out of heaven. And when I line myself back up with heaven, I can appear before El Elyon, my only judge. And I can say, look what he did. And I'm begging the king for justice. Because when the king comes back, he's coming back as the one who will dispense justice in the earth. And I love the next verse. Look it up in Revelation. The next verse is, there was no place for the devil found in heaven and he was cast out. You see, he's been up there all by himself making accusations against you because there was no believer standing before the court. The Bible says, I can come boldly to the throne of grace that I can receive help in a time of need. That's that court. You got to come on legal terms based upon legal things in the kingdom of God. And we've been letting the devil run rampant up there because none of us will go because the law has been done away with. No, I got a legal right by the blood of Jesus to be there. The accuser of the brethren becomes the accused when we show up and he's cast out. I think it's time to turn some heat on the devil. Why don't you spend some time on the Day of Atonement tomorrow making up your legal decree? These are the things the devil has done that I'm going to appear before the judge. And I I want a settlement. I'm I'm suing the devil. I'm suing the devil. He tried to crush my vision. He tried to crush my dreams. He tried to take my very life. I'm going to take it up before my king and say, I want restitution. Because the word says that if you catch a thief, he must restore it sevenfold. The only way you can really catch a thief, you've got to appear before the judge and you've got to give accurate witness to what he did. Come on now. You see, the righteous, you see, uh, it's, it's humbling. The Bible says if you don't humble yourself, you're cut off. Well, see, humbling is the devil did this, but I also realize that Jesus is the only one that can fix it. And because I have been covered in the blood, I have, uh, my life has been redeemed, I can stand before a holy God and point to an ugly devil and say, look what he did, Daddy. Look what he, he stole my joy. You see, there, as the world is expecting to cascade into darkness, some believers are going to get their strength back. They're going to go before the judge and say, all my life he made me depressed. And right now, I ask the king would judge that and replace it with the garments of praise. He's afflicted my body with sickness and disease, but I find in the word that by my judge's stripes I am healed, and I'm asking for a divine ruling on this right now. He's stolen my joy. He's stolen this. He's stolen that, and I've caught him, and I'm bringing him before the judge. And I'm asking that he be bound and that he has to make recompense, that he has to make restitution for what he's done. 2012 is going to be the year of restitution if you do it right. If you do it right. You see, what I'm believing is all the saints are going to be known for the joy that's in their heart. Well, everybody else is saying, woe is me. Everybody's all the, saying, woo, it's me. I'm excited about God. You see, the darker it gets, the brighter I shine. Because my light has come so that I can draw them into Jesus. That's where we're headed, guys. That's why this year the fall feasts are so, there's, it's pivotal in the spirit. Because God's got his eye of loosing strength back to the remnant. You've got to choose to receive. Get back in line with the kingdom of God. Make your petition tomorrow. Next week, we're going to have our tabernacle celebration. And just just mark it on your calendar. Here is where the restoration begins, and it's going to go a whole year. You see, I don't want just one little God just one day. I want a thing just to begin to build and 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 keep burning for a year. Because if you let God build it for a year, it'll take a long time for it to burn. That's right. I want to become an oak of righteousness in the kingdom of God. Father, we just come before you right now in the name of Jesus. Father, we bring all of our broken dreams, 
our shattered visions. We bring our weariness before you right now. And Father, I ask that the king would judge the enemy in our behalf. Lord, command the blessing upon your people. Judge in righteousness. Let sickness and disease be broken. Let weakness be broken. Let depression be broken. Let vision be restored. Let the joy of the Lord come. Let provision come. Father, restore and add to that which the enemy has taken. Father, let us be stronger at the finish than we were at the beginning, I ask. And Father, I ask it because we've been blood bought and blood washed. We are a redeemed people. And that blood covenant brings us into line with heaven. And Father, the enemy has violated your word by touching your anointed. Now, Father, bring judgment and bring restoration, we ask. In Jesus' name.